warning and protective action. But this is one of the, uh, like I said yesterday, I touched on, this is one of the things that I think when it comes to what we've contributed as an agency to uh, the understanding of potential loss of life, this is the thing I'm actually the most proud of in what we've done. Um, and so when I talk to you about some of this, um, I, I think when you hear from, if you, if you could hear from Dr. Maletti and Dr. Sorensen, who really came in and helped us do this, they were so excited that somebody from the federal government finally opened the doors and said, come tell us what you know, help us implement this throughout the, the country and how we do things. Um, so there's some, some really important advancements here. Really, I want to describe a little bit what I touched on yesterday. We're going to do a deep dive on the warning and evacuation timeline and, and talk about those factors that really matter the most in terms of the timing of how quickly stuff happens and why people do what they do during an emergency. And then I'm going to talk about how we go about measuring um, the different factors. And it comes all, all back to these essential elements and we're focusing on that second bullet there, the redistribution of people. And it's the warning and the response part of that. So just to put that, those acknowledgements out there, <clears throat> Dr. Maletti and Dr. Sorensen were the primary researchers. Uh, this goes back um, many, many years, uh, probably seven or eight years ago, myself and Will Lehman, we were at a, the, a big conference on a California major disaster and Dr. Maletti came in and we had been looking like, okay, we know we need to find somebody to help us turn this understanding of warning and evacuation into something we can use in our modeling. And then Dr. Maletti was up there talking and he's a really uh, good speaker talking about um, all the stuff he knows about why people do what they do. And he calls himself a quantitative social scientist, which was perfect for us because we needed to take all of this understanding and turn it into numbers that we could use for modeling. Uh, he was the uh, director of the Natural Hazards Center at Boulder, Colorado. So he has an impressive background. Um, he's one of the people that's called out anytime there's a major disaster. So for Katrina, he came out and did a lot of the forensic research on, on what happened and why people were still there when the flooding showed up. Um, after 9-11, he was called in to do a lot of the research there, the forensics. Um, so when it comes to there's an emergency and we want somebody to go and talk about and understand the warning and evacuation, he was one that was called in. Um, so the only, we went up to him and said, hey, will you come help us out? And he's like, I, I don't know you, no, no thanks. Um, but Dr. Mosier, who was the Corps' previous chief economist, had worked with him on Katrina and they I think they were drinking buddies back in the day. So we were able to get him to come and help through Dr. Mosier. And he brought along his partner, uh, Dr. Sorensen, who um, has a very similar background in terms of understanding warnings and how warnings spread. So we were really lucky to get those two to, to come help us. And they laid out all this research for us. They answered the questions we had. Um, and then we worked with Dr. Bowles, who I mentioned earlier, who was really the, the researcher that started LifeSim at Utah State University. And then we had two different um, researchers, doctors from the University of South Carolina and the University of Washington, so Dr. Cutter and Dr. Lindell, who are also known experts in this area, go through and do uh, all the review of everything that Sorensen and Maletti came up with, provide that feedback and try to poke holes in it. Um, and then a lot of what we did, we tested on the, the emergency managers in Sacramento and Yolo County, where, where I live, had them come sit with us and say, hey, here's how we're, how we're treating this, here's our interview schedule, let us practice some of this on you and give us your feedback. So that's how this effort went. But really the goal here of their research, when we went to them, we said, all right, we need some quantitative approaches to estimate human behavior to help support our life loss estimate. That's the going in part. Um, and then ways um, to go out and measure uh, community behavior, time estimates for warning issuance, diffusion, protective action, we'll get into that. And then this last one here, I think is, the, is probably the coolest thing that came out of it, and maybe the most useful thing um, for the community at large, was this local community guidebook to inform emergency managers about the social scientific evidence-based warning practices. So 
we came out of all this with a really consumable guidebook that we, hand, we can hand off to anybody in emergency management that says, hey, here's what the science says really matters if you're trying to do your job well. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll show you that pieces of that throughout this presentation and then we can look at it afterwards. So here's the timeline. I talked about it yesterday, but just a, a quick review, right? We start with when that threat is detected or, or notification is received. So a lot of what you're going to see about those lines get blurred between threat detection and notification received. Um, so I'll try to make that a little bit clear, <clears throat> but often for those protracted events, events that last a long time, um, or there's a lot of build up to the events those two things are kind of at, at the same time. A lot of what also what I'll talk about, we did all this research um, and they did this that wrapped it up in probably 2017, 20, or yeah, 2016, it's been a while now. But one of the first things they said was, look, this is based on a body of knowledge that we've had over our lifetime of experience, each 30 years plus. Um, but things are changing, technology is changing. We need to test all of our assumptions using something new, something that's out there today. And so we had written a scope and we were sitting around waiting for the next major disaster to come through so we could jump in right afterwards and do surveys and really say, all right, here's how fast we think warnings are gonna spread. Let's go out there and measure it after a major event. Um, so we had that ready to go. We were sitting around waiting for it and the Oroville incident occurred which is right in my backyard and it was really the perfect um, incident for something like this for many reasons one it was a really large scale event related to a dam um, but even more importantly was it was an let's see all the qualifiers the largest peacetime non-hurricane evacuation in the u.s um, everybody evac evacuated large percentage evacuated but the important part is um, they all came back home afterwards the actual event didn't occur and displace a whole bunch of people like after Katrina so many people moved out and never came back it'd be really hard to survey uh, the statistical representative sample for something like Katrina but Oroville they all came back so we went out and did a, a large survey throughout the communities to really understand all the different things we're trying to measure and, and either reinforce what we thought we knew or we gained some new insights and, and adjusted accordingly based on that. So I'll talk to you a lot about what we learned in that Oroville incident too during this. But let's start with the warning delay time. So between when the notification is received at the emergency management agency and when they actually flip the switch on whatever warning systems they have in place, we call this the, the warning delay time. So the factors, so this is a, a snippet from that, uh, the guidebook that I talked about. And what they did is identified all the primary factors. So those factors that influence this delay time the most, the secondary factors that have an influence, um, but not as much, and then tertiary. They have an influence, but it's, it's much smaller compared to the other ones. So those are all listed in here. I'll focus on the primary ones. So what you see here um, are the four things that I touched on briefly yesterday, but the emergency inf uh, public information plan is written down and standard operating procedures to support that plan are written down. And they, they were very much focused on, this, this needs to be written down. You can't go talk to an emergency manager and they say, yeah, I have a plan, all right? The, you need to have it written down for a couple of reasons. One is until you some really write something down, you're not sure you have everything really fully thought out. Um, two, right, you, it needs to be able to something somebody else can pick up. And also, it's hard to practice a plan if you don't have a plan written down, right? So there's a lot of reasons why writing it down makes a big difference in terms of how effective it's going to be. The next one here, um, but, but that's pretty straightforward, right? If you have a plan, you're probably going to do better than if you don't have a plan. The third one there is one that other um, industries have, but we don't have, we haven't really pushed out into dam and levee safety or flood flooding as much. And this is that triggers to distinguish the different threat classifications and public messages 
are in place. And I'll talk to you more about what that looks like. Um, and then the last one here is rules and procedures are in place for dam, levy, operator, um, and emergency manager communication. So I own the dam and I have standard operating procedures and rules in place for how to communicate with emergency managers downstream, right? That's, so that's pretty straightforward. Here's what we talk about when we're thinking about this concept of, of triggers. You've gone through and thought about all the different ways you might see issues related to your dam or levy. You've laid them all out, almost like a potential failure mode analysis. Here's the things that could go wrong, and then what that means is if we start to see it. So you identify, here's the things that could go wrong. You identify the threat level designation, what's it going to lead to, what that flood threat is. And then the last piece, which we haven't done really well, is to say, let's tie that to what we're going to tell the public. If we can think through all of this ahead of time, instead of trying to figure that out on the fly, you're, you're really going to be able to condense that, that warning timeline. Because trying to figure that out on the fly adds a lot of um, confusion. And we'll, as part of the uh, Oroville case study that I'll walk through, you'll, you'll see some of that. So I talked about the factors that really matter, but then they also provided us with some quantitative estimates so that we can go through and, and add this into our modeling and understand with how much, a certain amount of time, how many people are going to get warned and to talk about how many might get out of the way. And you saw these yesterday, but they, they gave us these four curves that for this delay time. So you can see with uncertainty, hey, really well prepared. And these are based on their understanding of, of case histories. So they have a, a, a large group of case histories where they know the emergency managers were well prepared and then they can say here's the uh, how long it took that delay to occur. And then that's how they pulled the factors out and that's how they developed these curves. And this is how this was our starting point for what we use now in in life sim. So when you try to run something like LifeSim or what you saw yesterday when we were going through it by hand, you can use this kind of information to start putting together this, this timeline in quantitative uh, ways. So back to this, now we have an interview schedule that helps us measure each one of these. So when I talk about the factors and how we measure them, there's this interview schedule um, where you can, we go out and for example, for this one, this is one of the secondary factors, sorry, um, we can't see very well down here, but you, you have responsibilities defined for, for communication that's shown here um, and that they have the authority to do so. So we ask, is a particular person or position responsible for getting a first alert or warning out to the public? Sitting down with your lead emergency managers in the communities downstream and you have this back and forth it, it's really valuable um, do they have the legal authority to do so and one thing i'll say about this if you go out and talk to emergency managers um, about this as long as you come from a, a place of hey this is based on the sci scientific knowledge from these researchers this is not the army corps of engineers pretending like we know how to do your job better right if you can you can build that first level of trust they're really interested in this kind of information and if you can get the right people in the room, because usually it's a multi-agency effort, if some large scale disaster is going on, if you can get them all in the room and start asking these questions and then start seeing the interaction between them and the conversations they're having and some misunderstandings they may have had before, the, just the, the risk reduction that you gain just from having all those people in the room and asking these questions and having them go through this coordination effort is it's been a really useful thing and we always get positive feedback from them after something like this okay so what does warning delay time look like in reality we have these curves but uh, like i said we went out to orville and we tried to, uh, to actually measure it so what happened during the orville event Hazard notification um, was at a 3.30 Sunday afternoon. Um, and I don't know how many of you remember the Oroville, Oroville event 2017. Um, it was actually, a, like I said, a protracted event. They noticed a problem in their main spillway, service spillway. And this was a, a <coughs> so they 
shut the water down, looked at it, there's a big hole there, that's not good, but there's still a lot of rain happening, so they can't not use it. So they start trying to figure out how much water they can let out without eroding out a, a lot more of the main spillway. They tried to do this balancing act for a couple days, um, but it ends up too much water came in, more than they were expecting. Then they had to use the emergency spillway, which had never been used before. And then that started eroding. Um, so there was a lot of information out there for a couple days about problems at Orville Dam. But the main evacuation happened on that Sunday afternoon after the emergency spillway started eroding and they got really nervous about that. They were all sitting around in the room in the <coughs> main area. And so Sheriff Honey from Butte County is, was kind of the, the lead emergency manager responsible for a lot of what was going on. But it was again, a multi-agency effort. FERC was out there, DWR was out there, every, everybody was out there for many days. Um, and they thought it was winding down. They had gotten to a point where the emergency spillway had flowed for a while and the water was starting to come down. Sheriff Honey had actually was just coming through, shaking everybody's hand, saying, job well done, I'm finally going home. I will go work out and go to bed. And he heard somebody say, hey, does Sheriff Honey know about this? So he went over and talked to them um, and they were getting photos and information showing that the erosion on the emergency spillway was getting really close to the, the main concrete sill and started to worry about it undercutting. Um, so that got everybody excited. Um, and that was at, at 3.30, one of the geotech engineers came in and said, um, if this continues, it's going to undercut within an hour and lead to uh, a large release. And so one of the things uh, Sheriff Honey talks about, right? So everybody gets excited there and that's at 3.30. Um, and then from 3.30 to 3.51, there's a lot of, all right, what's this mean? And when you talk to Sheriff Honey, he's like, this is me trying to get engineers to tell me something that I could act on. And that communication was a struggle. Um, and finally, somebody said, if this happens, it's a 30 foot wall of water coming down the side of the mountain. Um, and that was enough for him to say, hey, and it's like a room full of engineers a lot of people all excited for him to say, hey, is there anybody in this room that thinks there's a good reason not to order an evacuation? And imagine if I was in that room, I wouldn't be like, oh yeah, I think everything's gonna be fine. All right, that's gonna be really hard to say. No, it's good. So at 3.51 uh, on that Sunday afternoon, they said, all right, we're gonna order an evacuation. How do we know that? Um, so DWR was really open with us we went in and interviewed them afterwards, all the people that were in the room. FERC was really open with us. Sheriff Honey was really open with us. So we were able to do a lot of investigation in terms of what happened and figure out these timelines. And there were people in the room, a couple of them, that lived in Orville. Um, and they went back through their texts and found when they texted their family to get out before the, because they decided in the room it was going to happen. They texted their family to get out. So we could tell pretty exact when that decision was made. Um, <clears throat> then we also know when the actual first warning went out to the public, which was 30 minutes later. So you got that 30 minutes between when they knew they were going to order evacuation and when the warning went out. So what do you think was happening during that time? Figuring out extents of, of who to warn, okay? That's right. And one other thing, so who to warn and what do you think the other thing was? How to warn. How, how to warn is a little bit more specific than that. Yeah, that was it, All right? So who to warn and, and what to say. So let's talk about that. This goes back to the importance of accurate inundation maps. So what they had was a, their emergency action plan. And what are the standard flood maps in emergency action plan? At least historically until Oroville started to change all that. You got your sunny day failure. 
and your, your PMF. Um, and therefore the main dam. Orville Dam, tallest earthen dam in the U.S., tallest dam in the U.S., it's a big dam. Um, so what they had was a map, a breach of the main dam, which they weren't even worried about, the emergency spillway was not going to impact the main dam. Um, but this is the map they had. So, largest dam in the U.S., it's, what I always forget, it's like almost 800 feet. And if you've seen these studies before, you're basically, the dam evaporates and the water goes downstream. So, what do you think the peak outflow was for this map out of Oroville Dam? Take a guess. That's a guess, no. <laughs> um, higher, no. So, Think about this way, the largest flow ever recorded on the Mississippi was 2.3 million. Um, so if you look at their emergency action plan, it's 35 million CFS. <laughs> so think about that, right? That's, there's never been a flow recorded that I, um, like anywhere in the world that I could find. So it's really high. So they, they all knew like, okay, that's not the problem. We got this map. How do we figure out who to, who to warn? And Sheriff said he put his hands on this map and kept moving in until somebody said stop. They drew a line around, polygon around that, and that's how they, they sent their warnings out to that. Not ideal. Lots of things have changed since then. Even DWR knew that that wasn't ideal at the time and had a bunch of efforts underway to do more inundation mapping for more scenarios, including the appurtenant structures, right? Having one specific to this, where after looking back, where we had plenty of time to look at it, um, the most likely breach scenario, even if it breached as they were concerned about, probably would have stayed in the levee, and levee downstream. Right. But there's no way that we had time to get confident about that at the time. So um, definitely error on the side of safety. And, and, and I don't think anybody really second guessed that. Okay. So <clears throat> we also went through this effort of, all right. If we had applied our little, our measurement, gone out and, and interviewed them before the Orville incident occurred, what, we, what would we have predicted that would have happened? How long would these delays have been? Was, was our measuring going to give us something close to what actually happened? This is the curve we would have developed for them with the warning delay time um, and their actual uh, delay was around uh, 45, 50 minutes. So, okay, it's not that far off of the, the fat part of the curve, so we weren't too unhappy with that. Um, all right, next one here is the warning diffusion time. How long does it take for warning to spread through your community? They flip the switch on the warning systems that they have. How long does it take to, to warn the population? Again, you can see the primary, secondary, and tertiary factors. And talking about the primary, <clears throat> so distribute the message over at least five different communication channels. Um, five, they just, they wanted to put a number in there that said, yeah, that it needs to be a lot, but they didn't want to say a lot because that's not that helpful. So again, I mentioned this briefly yesterday. All these communities are, are diverse. How they interact with the world is diverse. Don't just rely on one silver bullet technology because you're not going to be as effective as you could be otherwise. Use them all and, and embrace them all. But there are some modern technologies and make sure you're using those because we're all walking around with this warning, warning device in our hand. So let's, let's use those. Um, repeat the messages. There's, there had been some confusion among emergency managers that they didn't want to repeat it unless something was changing. Um, and this is just reinforced now. Make sure you repeat that message. Sometimes it takes a couple for people to really, to really get it. And again, I talked about being able to wake people up at night, that's a struggle. Um, sirens are one way to get there. There is, I mean, it used to be landlines were a lot easier. Um, 
There are some new technologies coming available now that everybody's has these wireless or connected phone, uh, homes where there's a near future where all your lights and radios turn on in your house in the middle of the night because they're trying to wake you up in the middle of a, an emergency. So look forward to that. In this guidebook, they also list the different types of dissemination channels. So when I talk about warning systems, this is what I'm talking about. These are all the different ways that you can spread some warnings. And they talk about how quickly the coverage, concentration, and message comprehensiveness. So some, alert, uh, some examples from yesterday, right? That first one, route alerting. We talked about Teton Dam, the guy running around on foot, knocking on doors, and providing messages. That's what that's a route alert. People just walking along a route to do it. Um, it's really slow, but like we saw yesterday, the message comprehensiveness is really good. If they have the right message, they're able to get that message across. Whereas for aircraft, same thing, the Teton dam failure example, which we're going to hear a lot more about from Woody. Um, there was aircraft flying over those two fishermen trying to warn them. They thought he was just waving at them, right? They had no idea that he was trying to provide a warning. So the, the message comprehensiveness is very low, even though you can get out over a better area. So this is all spelled out in, out in there. Um, <clears throat> so how do people receive their warnings during the Oracle um, incident? So there's, there's actually two counties. So Butte County is where Oroville is. That's real close to the dam. And then as you saw in our little example yesterday, uh, we did a separate survey for Yuba and Sutter, which is Marysville, Yuba, Yuba City are the main areas further downstream. Um, but similar results here. Um, traditional is radio, newspaper, TV. Still really effective for a big percentage of the population. Modern, that's your, all your cell phone related things. Um, but informal is, like I said yesterday, grandma or some friend calling you saying, hey, do you know what's going on, right? So even with everybody having this new technology, one of the most effective ways is, is grandma's calling you and, and getting that message out there. So this is what the doctors Belletti and Torrenson provided to us and said, you know what, worst case scenario, we don't think it's going to get worse than this lower bound in terms of time zero. This is when the flip is switch, uh, the switch is flipped. Um, and this is the percentage of the population that you're targeting that's received that warning. All right. So if you're not, if you don't have all the different um, warning technologies in place, then it, it could go pretty slow. But you can get you can get really effective really quickly if you if you do all the stuff that we suggest. A lot of uncertainty in between there. Like I said, if we go out and do that um, elicitation with the emergency managers, we're going to just narrow those bounds. This is our hey, we don't know anything bounds. We'll narrow those bounds. We'll have a, a here's our most likely. But you're still going to have some uncertainty there. So what what did it look like for Butte County during the Oroville event? Um, it's not the best graphic, but that red line is what we actually measured through the survey. And those other three lines are what we would have predicted if we didn't know what was going to happen. So not horrible, but um, could be better. And we're making, uh, there's new versions of this coming out actually within this month that have some of this built in. Um, but for something like this, we weren't as concerned, right? We missed how quickly that warning went out at the beginning. We think some of that's related to the fact that this was a, a protracted event. Everybody was kind of tuned in to what was going on at Orville already. Um, so I think everybody was, was kind of more alert than they would have been otherwise. So that's why that warning got out and, and people received it a little bit quicker than maybe just a, a surprise event. Okay, last piece here, the, the protective action initiation. So what do you do once you receive the warning? How long does it take for you to evacuate? And really a big piece of that is, I've been through many conversations where people start to talk about what percentage of the population is going to evacuate, right? 
and that obviously for what we're trying to do here, especially for those longer, if you're talking about 20, 30, 40 hours downstream, it's not how quickly, it's whether they choose to at all that really starts to matter. Here's your factors, um, the long list of primary factors here. Um, and I touched on this a little bit yesterday. If you look at the tertiary one, it matters, but it doesn't have nearly as big of an influence. It's ongoing public education program about dams and levees to motivate household preparedness is in place. Right? So they, they listed that as tertiary. So why do you think it's not that effective? I think I gave you some hints on it yesterday. Not as effective as some of these other things. For something like that, you're kind of in advertising marketing mode where you got to get something splashy out there to catch their attention and hope it, that they're willing to, to, to pay attention and modify their actions based on that. And that is hard to do when everybody's going about their daily lives not worried about it. So where they put their primary focus is in what really matters. And that is all about getting the right message in front of the people during an emergency because that's when you have their attention. So example messages or templates covering the range of possible public actions and threats have been prepared. So you're not making it up on the fly. You have templates that you can just fill in the gaps on. Procedures are in place to de deliver messages spoken by a person, right? So having an alarm going off is a lot different than somebody actually communicating a message to you. Procedures are in place to deliver messages repeatedly. Um, Example messages address what parents should do if they have children in school, interpret environmental cues. Jesse talked a lot about environmental cues, so how to interpret those. Um, so it's all about what a message should contain to get people to respond quickly, right? And they said it over and over again, once you have somebody's attention, don't worry about this. Keep it short and simple. You have their attention. Get all the information to them first time up front then they're not going to go ask their friends they're not going to go online they're not going to go get wrong information somewhere else they'll have everything they need to do what they need to do right there so single most important thing an emergency manager can do is provide the best message possible what's that look like source talked a little bit about this yesterday if you provide a source up front it builds in that trust not us, it's not the Army Corps of Engineers, it shouldn't be the source. What's best is if you have a, hey, the, the Corps, your local weather agency, and, and local emergency managers are all together on this. And they all agree on something like that. That's the best. But otherwise, that source of trust is going to be somebody in the community that they're aware of. Threat. So describe the flooding event and its impacts. Location, so specificity is really important on something like that, like this. State the impact area boundaries that, in a way that can be easily understood. Um, and I'll give an example of this. Tell people what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and how doing so is going to reduce the impacts. And then end that with an expiration time. Tell them this is when this message expires. If you can get all that out there, great. So let's, more on specificity. Be specific. If you're between the river and first street, move north of main street. That's specific. If I would know what to do with that. If you say evacuate, if you're near the river, that's a little fuzzy, right? So the more specific, the better. Be clear, wall of water, 20 feet, moving faster than a person can run. Got it. Even as an engineer, 10,000 CFS per second, or 10,000 CFS moving at 20 feet per second. I'd be like, well, I'm gonna have to think about that. See how worried I am. Maybe go run RAS, right? So, so be very specific in ways that people can understand. So in this guidebook, another great thing that the doctors did for us was give message uh, template examples. 
And they did it for a whole bunch of different warning systems, right? You have character limitations on some of the, the t tweets or some of the warnings you can provide on your phone. So they said, if you're limited to this many characters, this is how you should build that message. And then gave a bunch of different examples. And similar to the previous one, they gave us an idea of, here's the bounds on after you've received the warning, what percentage of the population would take that protective action that's recommended in the warning. All right, so what does it look like? So this is the actual message that went out, first message that went out um, on Oroville Dam. So now that we're all warning message experts, let's, let's critique this. Give me some ideas on what could be better. Immediate evacuation from low levels of Oroville and areas downstream is ordered. Think of areas downstream of Oroville, it goes all the way out to San Francisco. I live in Davis, California, um, near the Yolo Bypass. I uh, talking to the emergency manager in Davis. Um, she knew what was going on enough to know that Davis wasn't at threat. But this message went out to all emergency management organizations downstream, so our local firefighter, local police, all got it the same time she did. Um, and they started calling her saying, should we be evacuated? And she was able to talk them all through, like, no, this is not meant for us. What we need to prepare for is a bunch of evacuees coming into Davis, right? So that's a whole different story um, and led to some significant inefficiencies, inefficiencies in the system all, all the way downstream. We're increasing it. You're going to see an increase. If you're in the, the stream channel downstream, you're going to see more water. Probably should have said get out of the way from that. Um, but yeah, the 100,000 CFS, unless you're really tuned in to the, how much water's coming out of that on a daily basis, that's not going to mean a lot to you. Yeah, and they got a lot of flack for using this auxiliary spillway term. Nobody knows, <laughs> Nobody knows what that is. Um, <clears throat> so that's another thing that changed. Um, but what about that last sentence? Can you, the very last, the spelling error, this N not a drill instead of this is not a drill that lets you know that they were probably developing this on the fly rather than using templates. So we go back to, all right, trying to figure out who to warn and figure out what to say. They had to put together this message in that stressful situation and that's not ideal, right? Okay, so of the people that were targeted to evacuate, these are the people that they said should evacuate. Um, here's the percentages that actually did. This is good information for us when we're trying to say what percentage of people are going to evacuate. Yep. This is really helpful, but even more helpful is trying to understand why. What percentage, why did a certain percentage of these people not evacuate? What was listed, which was, was called out the most, um, so you guys forgot looting. Everybody talks about the potential for looting. Some people said, I'm not leaving, I'm going to stay here and protect my property. Um, the second one there, they didn't believe it, so a couple people touched on, hey, it's not going to happen. Some people had to stay there to, to do a job. They felt their job was important enough they needed to be there. Um, <clears throat> didn't have the ability, not necessarily just mobility, physically unable is a piece of it, but not having the resources, a vehicle to go out, it, it was too much. Um, and then traffic related was the last one. So we got like 800 surveys back and everybody filled out this information. So it's interesting reading through that, right? It didn't, did not think there would be a flood, a lot of, sorry, DWR doesn't know what they're doing, everything's gonna be fine. Um, God told me not to, back to the Teton example, or no, sorry, which one? The Kelly Barnes, yeah. Um, so looking at these, and then the traffic related one, a lot of people said they were either watching TV and just saw all the roads backed up and they didn't want to get out there, or they even went out and they, they were stuck in traffic and said, never mind, I would rather wait this out in my house. So all good reason so we can start thinking about these as emergency managers saying which ones of these can we try to impact right did not think there would be a flood 
a lot of that has to do with your messaging. Trusted sources, giving them the right information, you can break down some of those barriers. Dr. Maletti's always said like, the hardest thing for an emergency manager to do is to convince somebody that they're not safe because everybody goes through life, hey, it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be fine. Being able to break that down and change their mind that no, you're actually in danger, that's, that's the hardest thing. So let's get the right message out there so we could impact that one. Stay behind to protect property, that one's a little tougher to impact. Um, resources, okay. We know there's going to be people in our communities that don't have the resources to evacuate. Let's plan for that ahead of time, have the public transportation necessary to get them assistance and get out of there. Um, physically unable, same thing. We can, we can provide some help for those. Traffic related, we can do better evacuation planning. Um, so right after this, they realized, all right, this is a big problem, took forever. Let's revise our evacuation plan. They came up with a zoned evacuation plan. I don't think Stephanie is talking about the study we did to compare their old evacuation plan versus the new evacuation plan in Lifesim. Basically showed it's not going to be a significant improvement because it comes down to there's just a lack of, of road out of there. And you, you can't do much about that. There are conversations about building more bridges over the river to allow for better traffic flow during something like this. So. But there's not a lot to do there. This is what it actually looked like compared to what we would have uh, predicted. Again, you see it happening a little bit quicker. I think the, some of that has to do with people kind of knew what was going on, or were kind of ready for something and jumped out of there. There's also this pre-evacuation. Pre um, a lot of people that were out of the area said, oh, I don't want to go back there. Um, there's just too much uncertainty. A lot of people got nervous ahead of time and just left um, because they misinterpreted previous messages or just were nervous and left. So that's another thing to think about during an event like this, that you're going to have a significant percentage of people that say, I'm out of here, even if you haven't ordered an evacuation. Okay, interview schedule um, and scoring. So again, I talked a little bit about the interview schedule, gave you an example of that. Um, so what the Doctors Millennium and Sorensen did for us is, all right, here's how you measure these, and then here's how you translate those into a score and the weight associated with each one of those. So primary, tertiary, secondary, and, and all of this is in on the website um, in the extra material, supplemental materials. You can download all these reports, you can read about the scoring, you can have all the fun you want to with this. So is the Oroville report that talks about all the lessons learned from Oroville. So all of that's in there, you're, you're free to, to read it. Um, but this is kind of how this works out. And I think Jesse's gonna talk about this a little bit more tomorrow afternoon, talking in how interactions with your emergency managers. But specifically for scoring, <clears throat> what we have is set up this, this approach where all the different factors you link those questions to the appropriate factors and determine whether they get credit, give them a score, and then you can start to identify, all right, here's the areas where based on our understanding, there's areas for, for improvement, right? So in this case, they didn't have any warning thresholds in place. That matrix of here's what you should do, that a, carries a heavy weight. That's some place you could talk to them and say, hey, you, you should do this as part of your plan. That's gonna make a big difference on that warning delay time. So these, these are those links you can make and how it plays out in practice between questions, credit for a specific factor, turning it into an actual quantitative value. And then we use those curves and to, to scale our results somewhere in those, those curves that they provided us. That's for warning issuance, same thing for warning diffusion. Um, you have these different items where you get credit, possible score, possible improvement. And this helps a lot <clears throat> to be able to, to sit down, go back to the emergency managers afterward. This is what we thought you told us. This is how we interpreted it. Um, and then you can have that follow on conversation. And often they'll say, well, that's not what we meant. We actually do have that. Here's, here's some documentation on it and it's all fine, but 
again, there's a lot of positive things that come out of this type of interaction. Um, and the last one is protective action initiation, very similar. Okay, like I said, one of the best things that came out of this was this guide to public alerts and warnings for dam and levee emergencies. If you Google that, you'll see it's an engineering pamphlet now, core document, so you, you, you can have that. Share it widely. Anytime you talk to emergency managers, anybody who might be doing any sort of messaging based information, um, please share it with them. It's a really valuable document. Another thing they did was some myth busting for us. A lot of myths out there that emergency managers have that often delay them from wanting to issue a, an evacuation one. So they wanted to go through some of these. I'll touch on a couple of them, go into that guidebook and you'll see more of them. So this is Adam and Jamie. I did some fancy uh, graphics to put in Dr. Mileti on the left and Dr. Sorensen on the right. Um, so here's the, some myth busting that, that goes on. This cry wolf syndrome, asking the public to evacuate for a flood emergency that does not ultimately occur will reduce compliance next time. Is that true or false? They said, no, that is false. So why is that is what's important. Um, and there's a couple things. Really the, the only reason it's false is if you follow up with a good education and conversation about why you did what you did. Um, and that's one of the things that Sheriff Honey uh, did really well was afterwards, he went to every public meeting he was invited to. He let people like us in and had open doors about, hey, here's the information I had at the time. Here's why I did what I did and why I, I feel comfortable about it. And the, the community at large embraced him and said, thank you, got it, more trust is built. Next time you tell us to do something, we're gonna do it. Um, so that's a really important caveat to this. Uh, and then there's another caveat is, if it's something that happens all the time, every year you're being asked to evacuate and nothing happens, then you get that fatigue built in and they're like, no, no thanks. But for dam and levee safety emergencies, dam failure emergencies, that's not something emergency managers should be concerned about. In fact, there's been studies that show it actually improves compliance moving forward. Because what have you just done to this population? Informed. You've informed them. Now they all know there's a dam upstream that could have problems. Um, they have a lot better understanding of what an evacuation would look like, what they would do in that case. Um, but there's been studies that show more people, they're more, they're more willing to evacuate next time if you do all of this stuff correctly after an event. So that's really important. And you just got to practice your whole system. And so there's some value in there. I wouldn't recommend it just for that, but yeah. Traffic accidents increased during mass evacuations. Busted. Why? Really the whole concept of panic is pretty much busted, right? We, we watch too many movies where oh, something horrible is happening and people are all freaking out, going crazy. In reality, that very rarely happens. Um, and when compared to like rush hour, where everybody's pissed off trying to get home and angry at each other and cutting each other off and you get these accidents often because of just pure frustration, in an emergency evacuation like this, Communities come together and a lot of people, they're all in it together and you, there's a lot more uh, cordial activity going on. And it actually has the impact of relative to other large traffic situations, the, the number of accidents is, is less.